Hey, Clark, welcome to the Artist Appeals. So psyched to have you on. I am very glad to be here. Or back. We met at a uh, Electron. I was, I was so going to take the high road, and now you just <laughs> basically threw yourself into the volcano. So I'm happy to uh, have you explain to the class why we're here again. <laughs> Would you like to share? Hey, uh, you know, I got no shame. I flubbed up the technology. There was no audio. <laughs> so you guys are getting a re-recording of an amazing, amazing interview with Clark Higgins. Thank you. Huggins, with you. Uh, Huggins, my bad. See, we all screw up all the time. <laughs> you just got to own it. Own yep. it and go on. So, all right, let's start with our five rapid fire questions. You're uh, familiar with this. Let's do it again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, yep. What is the number one top selling piece of art product style or theme for you? Um, it would definitely be um, the Reckless Deck Volume 1 right here, which is, and we'll explain what this is, but this is basically like the, um, like the, the, the starting place for the Reckless Deck series. Yes, I love it. I have been touting you ever since I got Reckless Deck. I have been like sharing it with friends, educators. I just took it to a Saturday night like girl hangout and we just kind of did it for fun. She's That's like, am so I allowed cool. to look at my cards? Like I was having her draw them. She's like, am I allowed to look? I'm like, yeah, this is a little different. It's, it's a game, but it's not a game. I can't right, explain right. it. Let's just do it. <laughs> so we're going to do that here. We're going to do yes. a draw, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. All right. Number two, what is the one thing you love to create, do or make? I love figure drawing. I really love working from the model. Um, I've been working from live models uh, since I was 11 years old. My, really? parents used, my parents used to take me to Rhode Island School of Design uh, junior school, like their Saturday morning classes. They would drive yeah. me to Providence every Saturday morning and I would do RISD classes like for years. And wow. I was too young like I did all the sort of beginner kids classes. Yeah. And I was too young for the figure drawing class. And I was in the nature drawing class. And the teacher went around and said, you know, tell me why you're in this nature drawing class. And kids were like, oh, I like to draw turtles or I like frogs or whatever. And I, and I said, you know, honestly, I, it's the only class left for me to take because I'm too young to take figure drawing, which is what I really want to do. And she was like, hang on so then she like went upstairs to the figure drawing class and the teacher and they worked it out and they just like shuffled me right on in there and i started working from like live nude models at 11 years old that's fantastic that is so cool so you really have a background in art yeah for sure yes. but you also have a background in acting which we're going to get to right because reckless right. deck is this weird combination of both it's like this oh it's yeah. so cool even even much more so, you know, the second the second card series, the psyche series that we'll end up talking the about forthcoming. Right. <laughs> yep. I want a set and my friend Sarah wants a set. All right. Number three. Yes. So we asked, what is the one thing you love to do or make or create? What is the one thing you hate to do, create or make the most? I, I have to say the marketing really has me in a dark place these days like the actual the social media and the shilling that i have to do i feel like i have been like a real i've always had to especially as an actor like i've had to be a real hustler for yeah. for a long time now and i feel well, like to get it's really, gigs you got all right it's really in my dna before that i was a waiter like i used to wait tables and so i was like always out there like selling and hustling and shilling and I still feel like I am, like, I really enjoy the creating process of this. Mm -hmm. But then like the idea of if you build it, they will come is horseshit, right? <laughs> like that, that's not real. If you, if you build it, no one cares. Like you have to, you have to go out there and you have to scream from the rooftops, like yes. at, a, at a level and at a consistency that I feel like is like really uncomfortable. Really yeah, you need to... a megaphone nowadays yeah. with all the, I think people are overwhelmed. I mean, it's like being in the center of Times Square all the time. You have to blast you know? it out there relentlessly <sighs> and it's exhausting. It's time consuming and it is not, I don't find it that rewarding. And I, I feel think like a lot of people can relate to that. I think a lot of artists can relate to that. That whole field of dreams is, is such a, that movie, I mean, great movie and all, but bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that they had the internet when that came out. I think that everyone in the theater would have laughed had they said that. 
<laughs> or at least anybody who's ever tried to like promote their own project because that's right. just not that's, that's so and i feel like you just have to constantly be on that gerbil wheel of you know you can't do anything you have to always film yourself doing a thing you you can't ever just like create in private it always has to be like a promotional moment or a business moment and i find that really intrusive and really exhausting Oh, I agree. A hundred percent. I was just doing some art for my art agent last night and it was like, should I record this? But I don't want yeah. to. I just right. want to get right. in the flow. I just want to do it and just do it. I don't want to. Yeah, I get you. I totally get you. So I'm, right. I'm, I feel like the, the only thing I want to say is I'm looking for the moment where somehow I get to graduate from having to be responsible for that stuff where like that becomes somebody else's problem. Oh, isn't that the dream? That's the thing yeah. that we all want. Well, we got to work towards that. We got to find a plan, a way to do that. Um, all right. Number five, what is the most important piece of business advice you would give yourself today if you were just starting out? <laughs> I remember what we I remember what we said last time, and that was run in the other direction, <laughs> which is still not wrong. Um <laughs> I don't think when I started this, um, when I started this card deck thing, uh, we could talk for like an hour just about this. I don't think I had any idea what I was talking about in terms of the amount of effort and energy and like Sisyphus push the rock up the hill that, <laughs> that I was getting into. Yeah. I, yeah. I just, I think that I was like, Oh, I'll make a thing and it'll take about a year and it'll make us a bunch of money and then I'll move on to my next project. Right. Yeah. Well, like the arrogance of that is unbelievable. <laughs> but you know what? I think that's so true of any entrepreneurial business. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You just and you just have to do it. And there is beauty in starting a business. There is beauty in starting a card business or a craft business or, or your entrepreneurial journey. There's so much optimism and hope in it. But you're right. It's such hard work. And it's not, it's not, there's no duration to it. It doesn't end. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when you have your own IP, there is an extra level of, um, I don't know, of, of like anonymousness. Like it's another thing to like be an actor who's in a movie or to be an artist for Marvel Comics or Magic right. the Gathering because basically you are like hopping on the train of their, of their exposure, their momentum. Like you almost like pick up this massive audience that you didn't have to grow yourself right whereas doing something from the ground up you really start with like zero followers and zero people understanding what it is that you do and you have to literally like bleed for every single follower and every single customer well i think that's part of the appeals process is we talk about an e educating your audience not educating yourself but educating your audience and it is such a challenge so you mentioned ip which you guys just in case you didn't know cuz i had never really heard that term it stands for intellectual property and it's it's really just you know like a big overarching idea right am i right that it's kind of intellectual property kind of also um uh, how would you explain IP? Let's just define that it's, real quick. It's sort of like, like it could be anything that you created that you then own the rights to. Like um, maybe you created a piece of technology or maybe you created a game or right. maybe you created a movie or you wrote a book or a novel or yeah. um, a comic of, or a, a game a, or a deck or a comic or, or a podcast, craft. for example, yeah. which is your IP. Thank you. Uh, so anything mm -hmm. that you... Um, I don't necessarily know that like if you knit a hat, that that's like your IP. Um, but if you somehow did a bunch of hats that had a character that you created on it, that would be part of your IP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're right. When you create something, when you create this a big, beautiful, intellectual brainchild, yeah. then you have to be its parent and get it out there in the world. And yes, that's and a lot of, it's like being a parent. It never ends. <laughs> and it has no, you don't have any of the momentum that you're able to pick up by being able to say, oh, I'm, you know, I did this for Dungeons the Dragons or now I'm in, you know, the next Marvel movie. Right, right, you, right. You basically have to really grow it from nothing. Yeah, totally.
All right. So let's talk about art. So we always kind of categorize things and keep things moving with the appeals system, right? So art, yeah. product, presentation, educate, amplify licensing and contract terms and success. So how did you come up with this idea of reckless deck? I think this is about one of the coolest things I have come across in a while. Cause you know, I love education. I particularly love art education, and this is a fantastic tool for ideization, coming up with ideas for, uh, it, it, it blows my mind. Tell me about well, it. Right on. Thank you. Um, it's really, gr it's really gratifying, first of all, to hear people who get like legitimately excited about it and who really, who get it and really get a lot from it. That's, that always makes it um, worth it a little bit more when you get that kind of feedback. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm an illustrator uh, mm -hmm. professionally, and I found that I wanted to create uh, some kind of a game in the studio that will allow me to fast track the, uh, the ideation and the concepting and get to the page faster. I had um, a, lo a lot of desire to, to do just like practice craft, to actually just practice painting yeah. and to practice drawing without wanting to expend a lot of energy on coming up with like the great idea or the perfect idea. I wanted to just get to the page. Well, I think you told me earlier that you had just had a kid too, and you know, you didn't have as much time to create. And so you wanted when you had a little bit of time to just dive right into it and get to, creating. To really, really maximize it. Exactly. To, yeah. to be able to not burn you know, 30 to 60% of the time that you have the little window that you have just staring at the ceiling, trying to pull something down from the heavens. What yeah. am I going to paint? What am I going to paint? No, I get it. Cause after I had my second kid, I was like, I need to get back to creating. And I only had these little teeny tiny blocks of time. And so I yeah. started doing those Enso paintings I told you about. Right, right, right. Because you you don't have time to do some massive oil painting and let it dry. And then your kid comes and sticks their fingers in it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oil there. painting, like you don't even have time to lay a palette out. You know, you right. like the amount of time it takes to just get your, like your paint laid out and like your surface prepped and ready to go. I switched to digital when my son was born and I haven't seen really the opportunity where I get to go back and, and work traditionally again. Ugh, um, that's that day will come, I'm sure it will. And I'm actually really enjoying working digitally. So I'm not missing it that much. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and before COVID, we were doing- I think we have we to doing... be flexible. I think yeah. as artists, when you life gotta changes, adapt. you got to find ways to, you know, I went from really complex stuff like that, you know, to minimalism and still found gratification. And so you created this deck this card deck take some of those bad boys out let's yeah. start out this bad boy right and like show people what you're talking about because honestly just talking about it doesn't do it justice i gotta so i gotta I, show everybody your amazing card deck i'm a science fiction fantasy artist yeah and what i found is that you know sci-fi and fantasy really is um it's it's like a art language of stuff you know the thing that makes it sci-fi fantasy is, is really the props and the costumes and the setting and the world building mm -hmm. the surroundings like the mm -hmm. the dramatic experience of the characters are those kind of human or humanish experiences that we all you know i hate that guy i love that girl i i want that thing those are all you know whether you're wearing like an alien mask or a lobster suit or <laughs> you're just you like dolly they're still just experiencing the things in drama that we always come back to drama for. Mm. But drama. visually, sci-fi and fantasy, it's like really about like the sword, the shield, the ray gun, the jetpack, the, uh, the, the alien head, whatever that may be. Yes, the horns and, of the dragon. The... Yes. And yeah. so I, I started to go through all of like my old Spectrum, my copies of Spectrum, which is like annual for artists every year, a magazine, concept art magazine from uh, the UK called Imagine FX that I've been a longtime subscriber of. Ooh. Uh, my old comic books, like I just went through like all my comics and graphic novels and I just started to make lists of the stuff, the things, the, the tropes. You know, the things know, that come up over and over things, and over again, things that come up over and over and over again. And, and then I just gave each one at that time an index card and started to shuffle them and mix them together with without really paying any mind to, you know, where does fantasy end and sci fi begin and where does where that end and horror begin mm. and steampunk and so on. So mm -hmm. all of these tropes from all across <laughs> 
like this sort of like giant umbrella that is Comic-Con, for example. Yeah. Like taking all the Comic-Con booths and shaking them <laughs> up like a like a big like Yahtzee. A cup. snow globe. Yeah. And then dumping it out and seeing what you get. And that's how <laughs> I came up with, um, with, with this card deck series. And what I found was that it was so fun to do and so effective and that the ideas that I were getting were actually so legit that it had a lot more, um, it had a much bigger legs to stand on than I expected it to. It was a much more powerful and successful tool than I thought it was going to be. Well, you know, I took it to my friend's house um, just Saturday night and we did it together. We pulled cards. So um, there's within each deck, there's five categories, right? You want to yeah. walk us through the categories? Sure. And the she's first... not an artist. She's not a visual artist at all. And mm. I, we did this together and she, her brain was on fire. Yeah. Was, like, and I love seeing that at shows. That is one of my favorite things too, is to watch the thing come together in someone's mind yeah. without even really them it comes almost against your will. Like you, it's these yeah. things start to assemble. It works even if you're not a visual artist. So, um, okay. So first, ca- first category it. is called a uh, core concept, which is basically like your main idea category. It's probably, it's, it's very much a powerful category because yeah. it affects the design all over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is probably your go-to creature category. If you're really into making creatures or uh, monsters or non-human or aliens, yeah. This is where you Okay, hold it up, hold your... it still. Yep, so sure. We've got our first one is jungle animal attributes. All right, cool. Okay. CC. So and that kind of also... gives us our basic overview of what our creature has. Right. And you'll also find cards like vampire in there or um, things like fire attributes, you know, some kind of mm. elemental um, visual cue that yeah. you can build your design around. Yeah, it could be a fire elemental. It could be. Yeah. Um, an it ice elemental, a, it could be whatever. Or, or a superhero that uses that power. Right, right. Or, you know, somebody who's a, um, what are those guys? Like a race car driver who's got like flames up and down his his fire oh, yeah. suit or something. Yeah. So you can start to really interpret it and like iterate in like a million different directions. And the thing that you come up with is going to be very different than the thing that I come up with, even with the same card card. Right. So you pull a CC, guys. So you pull a creature... Attrib- a character what, what 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 did the cc stand for again core core concept core concepts thank you i keep wanting to go creature but core concepts so that's kind of the basis okay so now show us the next one there's okay, five so of these categories in each deck so the deck has these five things in it and you take one of each so the next one is modifications Modify. and that is that is like a body change that's more localized you know, Ooh, that is horns. a little bit, it's not an all over design thing. It's just like a one part of the body or one area of your design. So we talked about horns just like, you know, a minute ago, the horns of the dragon, you said. Mm-hmm. So this could be, this could be that, or it could be, there's lots of lizards and reptiles that have those kinds of horns. Yeah. There's, um, you know, yeah. You think about like demons or something like that. Like yeah. Hellboy has those horns that he like files down. <laughs> well, your first card that you gave me was jungle attributes and now okay. we've got horns. So I oh, don't so know why, wanna, but right, I'm wanna, thinking like wanna... Panther and then I'm giving my Panther some kind of like spikes all down its back or something. Oh, sweet. I don't okay. know. All right. Yeah. I'm doing it in my head. I'm, I'm picking one. All right. So next right. up would, would be your costumes category. Okay. And I'm going to, so I also want to hold this up here. This is volume two, right? We've got volume one, which is blue now. These are brand new tuck box designs. Oh, they're um, beautiful. With, and the embossing, own, that yeah, gold embossing is textile. Like you could tex- actually feel it, touch it. It's so cool. Some pretty sweet looking foil, foil action going on. There. Re- I'm really excited about these. These just came out. They just, we were been waiting for these. We've been playing what I like to call the, um, the global supply chain hunger games for the past <laughs> like six months since the summertime, like trying to get these things you know, yeah, delivered produced. and they've, they've finally, finally arrived. Um, so just for the next, um, our next category, I'm, I've decided just to mix it up. I'm going to pull from uh, volume two. Okay. Yeah. Volume one and volume two are totally different, which is crazy yeah, no- to me. No repeat cards anywhere in, in That's the system. amazing. Did I tell you I did this with my two boys when I came home from a Luxcon? No, no, no. And uh, my oldest, who's nine, 
dug it and he drew all these little creatures. He drew like six of them. Oh, I wish I had his drawing somewhere. I, I'll have to try and find it and stick a picture of it in here if I can. But it's adorable. He, he, he thought it was awesome to do that. That's great. So, you know, That's... And he's just using stick figures, but then he's giving them their 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 attributes and everything. It was cool. Really you know, cool. actually on my website, I have a free thing, a free download of like blank heroic body forms <gasps> for so that you can just print them that. out and, and like draw over the top of them or trace over them and, and like kind of dress them and decorate them. It's for oh, people whose, awesome. whose figure drawing skills maybe aren't all that great or, you know, for kids so that they can have the experience of like having like a muscular heroic body or like a fit female form and they can, you know, add stuff on top of them. I love that. I got to go get those. Yeah. That's really cool. Thank you. So here's your costume. It makes it even work more. Okay, so costumes next. Scarf or shawl? <laughs> My panther with horns has got a scarf or shawl. Well. Oh, ooh, maybe it's a bipedal panther. It's like a. Exactly. Almost like, like something a... from, what was that? Thundercats. Remember that show? <laughs> I do. I do. Thundercats ruled. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, like cats flying around in outer space uh, uh so maybe it's some kind of a bipedal cat you know character yeah yeah i like it yeah and it's got sp- spikes down its back as its horns i don't know mm-hmm. like maybe it, it could be horns. how do you see this this the scar for the shawl working yeah i don't know i think on that one i'm thinking maybe like wrapped around their head do you remember um avatar they had those long dreadlocks yeah so maybe mm-hmm. woven into some dreadlocks or something oh, sweet okay yeah or like yeah. you know um i was thinking like dune you know how they have those, oh yeah uh, those big almost like head poncho things where they like are yeah. all wrapped up um, yeah that was cool so we've so we've got those two those two different directions to go okay all so right. next category is weapons weapons give me a weapon clark give me a weapon okay hang on i gotta separate it from the rest of the deck all right here's what came up flintlock <laughs> okay okay so it's kind of steampunk yeah it not, could be kind um, of steampunk or piratey yep mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. it could have that shape it could definitely be more techy, but it could have the shape of that um that old style and i think the flintlock is like one of the most gorgeous just visually a gorgeous, gorgeous gun um, that evo- is really evocative of a certain romance. Yeah. You know, I like a lot of swashbuckling in, to it. I was in Colonial Williamsburg over the summer and they have a actual crafting place where they actually make rifles, flintlock rifles oh, wow. and the inlay. And they have little, um, they have on the butt have all this beautiful wood and inlay and they were all custom made and they still do this. They make these for customers. That's not just a demo for the tourists. They actually sell them. And um, they have like a, a box on the butt with hinges and stuff where you would have. You said butt twice. (laughs) But. (laughs) (laughs) That's three times now. (laughs) And we're six. (laughs) I do have boys. So butt jokes <laughs> for jokes. That is my life. <laughs> All right. So next category. <laughs> so we did weapon, right? Okay. Next category is um, accessories, which is stuff that you personal objects or stuff that you would have. I mean, talk about stuff. This is like literally the stuff category. Yes. Uh, and we have waiting for us a uh, thigh, Ooh, or, a thigh a calf. or a calf knife or sheath. I like it. Yeah, Like a, you know, like, um, like a diving knife or some yeah. kind of a um, hunting knife or something strapped either to your le- leg some somewhere. Cool. Cool. I love it. The possibilities are endless and it just takes you in all these different directions. Just makes my mind like go crazy. Yeah. And it really, uh, okay. We have one more category that comes <gasps> in volume two. Oh yeah. Um, and that's powers. Powers is the new category with a new addition. Uh, we'll be doing a lot more with powers and upcoming expansion packs. But right cool. now. Um, so there's six categories in each deck, really. There's five in volume one uh-huh. and six in volume two. So you get the new sixth category in volume two. Got it. Got it. And it looks like the power that we've got um, is reality warping. Oh, that's epic. 
Yeah. Do you like that? Yeah. Cause it's kind of that Dr. Strange thing. Yeah. What is, what does he do? He does like a hand twist and a two finger motion or something. Mm-hmm. Yes. I can totally see my creature like jungle attributes, time warping, uh, reality warping. Very interesting. Maybe the trees are like bending down and helping them out. Oh, what a good idea. Oh, that's a great idea. And suddenly like you now have a setting, you know, yep. now you just, what you did all on your own was like you went beyond character and you created a whole setting or a scene. Well, I got your world deck too. I had to have oh, a world fun. deck okay. and we did mm-hmm. that in conjunction with the reckless deck. So you guys, he has reckless deck, which is creature creating, which we just mm-hmm. did. And then mm-hmm. world, uh, the world deck creates a world. So we did it both and yeah, it's like put an our creatures creator. in the world. And it was so cool too. And I'll be doing a lot more with with worlds in the future. Like worlds is going to be getting massively blown out and expanded. But right now, it's it's just the one deck. Right, but you have a Whoops. forthcoming deck. You have psyche. Or psychic. Yeah, we have psyche. 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 Yeah, we have. Um, so what we just did, right? I made as a tool for myself as an illustrator, right? And and I geared it towards um, visual. Uh, sort of signifiers, you know, visual call outs. Right. And it's basically what, as an actor, you would call building your character from the outside in. Okay. Right. The so idea of. You made a product. You wanted to create art, but you made a product. Yeah. Which, yes. You know, the whole appeal system is about like, you've got to have something to sell. You got to have the art and then you got to make something from it because you've got to have something to be able to sell to make money yeah so, i think that that's that's extremely cool to to make that i think that uh, there's so many professional artists you know people who say um oh i just want to make art well you're not a professional artist anymore because the the key to being a professional is that it's your livelihood it's mm-hmm. your profession right. and so you're definitely not just making art because it makes you happy or makes and you feel therefore you have to treat it, it as such yeah you have to concept, you have to think about, okay, I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this for me, but how do I make it so that other people want it too? So your wife saw this, right? And was like, yeah, she was like, you realize this is not just for you. This is a thing that you've made. You've made a thing and you should go (laughs) and, you know, sell it. I've done a thing. I've made a thing. You know, she really didn't know how deep this rabbit hole was going to (laughs) be. And I Do you think, think that, she would tell you to run too? If she had to go back, she'd be like, "Oh yeah, oh yes." <laughs> I don't think that she's really enjoying the ride as much as I feel like I have grown to accept it. I right. don't think that she is necessarily loving this journey. <laughs> I think any spouse of an entrepreneur has their own. It's hard. It's a lot of work being an entrepreneur, and so the spouse yeah. has, you know. Um, there's ramifications. There's the ramifications. Is a great word for it. There's ramifications for sure. Right, right. Okay, so you made this thing. You did a thing. You made the thing. And she was mm-hmm. like, dude, it's not just for you. You have to put it out there. Yep. So talk to me a little bit about the process of making a product like this. You made a card deck. Can you just give us like an overview of how that happened in case somebody is sitting there going, I want to make a card deck. I want to make cards. Like, how does that even happen? There's lots of companies that do it. Um, They're pretty easy to find a simple Google search and you'll get lots of answers. Right. Uh, We hired a designer Mm -hmm. because I'm not a graphic designer. Like I don't work in Adobe Illustrator. I work Mm -hmm. in Adobe Photoshop or Corel Painter, these more, um, you know, yeah. illustration friendly programs and Illustrator, even though it's called Illustrator is more about like business cards and graphic design and fonts yeah. and stuff, you know, like yeah. I don't know kerning and fonts. That's not my, that's not my specialty. And I didn't right. necessarily want it to become my specialty. Right. So I, I, my sister worked in New York for a design firm at that time. And she was able to hook me up with a, a kind of, um, more of a beginner intermediate designer that she turned to who was more affordable and he did right. a great job um designing the very first iteration of reckless day so you gave him the cards you just had these ideas written on cards and you said hey can you make some backgrounds or something yeah and we talked about how they needed to really um not be any one <laughs> genre specific they needed to feel 
like a, a blend of, of different genres. They couldn't lean too fantasy or too science fiction or too, mm-hmm. it had to feel like it lived somewhere in the middle, which was a hard thing to do. Right. Right. Okay. And then you found a company to print them. Were you happy with your first printing? Did you get prototypes first? Um, we did not get prototypes first from that particular company. Our first run was only of a thousand decks, I think. So it was a pretty okay. small print, pretty in relatively small production run. Mm-hmm. And we had them done through a Chinese company and mm-hmm. they did a really good job. Uh, and they were, sorry, ah, they were good to deal with. And they showed up, you know, like two months later, which wow. really was a quick turnaround. And that really um, kind of bit me in the ass later when I was doing <laughs> larger print runs and was telling <laughs> my Kickstarter people, oh yeah, this will be, we'll have this done in no time. And it took much, much longer than that. And I had to really be like, oh, I didn't know that this was going to take six months. Why the time change? I don't know. I think that particular company just, that was the turnaround that they promised. And I have found larger printing companies. And especially when you have Kickstarters with lots of different elements, you know, mm-hmm. like we were only doing one deck. Right. The last, when I went and did my Kickstarter, I had a lot of decks and like a magnetic box and all these other things. Okay. Uh, so it's a bigger, bigger project. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. So presentation, we're kind of actually already talking about presentation. So you hired a graphic designer and they designed the cards. And um, I'm amazed that you got such a great product the first time around without even doing prototypes. Well, you haven't seen the very, very, very first. One. I don't have um, any of them handy. Well, you sold them there. out. I have a couple, you know, um, we right. did sell them out and it did get a redesign when we did the Kickstarter in 2017. Cool. And that's when I wanted to do volume two. And that's mm-hmm. when we did uh, a bunch of the expansions, you know, the, the genre specific 20 card packs that you can buy. Right. Um, so there's expansion deck guys where you can get a little pack of 20 extra cards that go for horror or for yeah. right. Steampunk or specifically or- for fantasy or steampunk. So the idea is that you can kind of um, customize your collection based on the things that you like the most. You know, if you're really into steampunk and sci-fi, you can get those. If you're really into fantasy and fairy tales, you can get those. So they're themed little packs that buff out your collection to reflect what you like the most. Very cool. I love it. I love it. So um, how did you start presenting this? Where Where are Reckless Deck available? And what did you learn from presenting, learning to present this new idea? Uh, I I sold it as like an add-on thing doing shows on my own. You know, like Mm -hmm. I was, I like to do, this is all pre-COVID, of course, where I was doing conventions to, um, you know, promote my art and sell my art, you know, whether it be prints or originals or drawings. I had tables at like Gen Con, uh, the the Fan Expo in Boston. You know, I, I was doing lots of different kinds of shows and I would sell it like at my, at my desk or at my table. And so it was, it was almost like an extra. It was an extra. Yes. And when we did the Kickstarter is when it started to become its own thing, mm. you know, and then we did toy sh- shows like toy fair in New York city. Oh uh, yeah. Um, which was the least happy convention I've ever done in my life. You would think toy fair would be fun, but it's like, it's not open to the public. It's all just buyers and industry. Yeah. And they are all business. Like they do not, they're not there to, they're not messing smile. around. They're not messing around <laughs> at all. Are they're, they like, what's your sell through? Well, not even like they didn't really even want to talk to you. Like they didn't, it was like some Roman noble walking through like a crappy part of town ah. where they just were like, I just am not, I'm going to not acknowledge your existence unless your toy or your, you know, doodad is specifically my market. I'm going to pretend you don't exist. Right. It was, it was rough. It was, you know, and I'm, an, and I'm, you know, 13 it's, years it's New the Yorker. big business of toys. If, I mean, it's I, big business. Yeah, if I hadn't been a New Yorker for so long and hadn't like really built up a, if I would just like Thicker some, skin. some, some like fresh face from Wichita, I think I would have really crumbled at Toy Fair. Have you ever heard of Astra? Yes. Yeah. Have you been to that one? No, I've heard of it, but I've never been. Oh, I want to go there. That's um the educational toy community. Mm-hmm. 
Um, Sounds like a good show I should look into, really. Yeah, yeah. So there's some shows, guys. Hey, let's list them. So we got Toys, the Terry Toy Expo in New York. We got Astra, which is um, I I don't remember where that one is because I haven't been. What else? You said um, you went to Gen Con. I mean, they're very different style shows. Oh yeah, Gen Con. Gen Con is a tabletop gaming show. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you like, and I didn't realize what a huge community that is. Yeah. People who, and I thought, oh, there's going to be, you know, video games and stuff there too, like Xbox and PlayStation. Gen Con is a massive, massive convention, and it is just for tabletop gaming, you know, oh, cool. board games and, and role playing games. That's it. And oh, it's really massive. Yeah. And then there's the licensing expo out in um, Vegas. Yeah. Worked that one time. That's like the branding. That's licensing expo is like the movies selling the rights to characters and stuff it's crazy yeah i there's a project i have in mind further down the road that i'm going to need to deal with some of that i'm not there yet still trying to do what's what's like on my current docket right now right well we're going to get to that here in the show too with the licensing and contracts at the end of the appeals process we'll talk a little bit about that so So you you, presented it at conferences yes go ahead and one of the things that i found it was one of the things that I found that people wanted them were asking for the most was, do you have anything that tells more about your character's story, more about their yeah. inner, their inner experience? Right. Um, right. I, like I, I've said a couple of times now, I made, you know, reckless deck for, for illustrators, right. For, for my goal was to make a tool for artists. Yeah. For what visual I found artists. was I found that writers and role-playing gamers like D players really right. came out for it in a way that i wasn't really anticipating they really found it useful and loved it but they were asking for more narrative content yeah and that was really across the board very consistently when i would do shows they would they would all i'd hear that every show i did you know i think it's amazing when you're an entrepreneur if you listen to the market they'll tell you what they want and you've got to listen and be willing to pivot and to change your product a little bit and to change your marketing a little bit. I think it's one of those things that you don't know what you don't know. And you go out there with something and you think it's one thing and then you show it to people and they're like, oh, wait, I need something else. I need this to evolve. And you just got to roll with it. Yeah. I think Mm -hmm. that's inevitable. You know, the, uh, the other, other great thing about that is that as you kind of threw out there, I spent 13 years as a professional actor. You know, right. I had all this illustration training when I was in high school and in college. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I did plays in high school and stuff, but in college, like I really found theater yeah. and it kind of stole me away. Like it really, um, and there was a lot about the theater that met my needs at that time. I think I was like a repressed kid from New England and I needed to kind of like shout it out more. I needed to learn how to, a place where I could do that. And it was really, right. um, a place where you could be really, really social and you could go to these kind of emotionally extreme places and the level of risk was really high and the adrenaline was really flowing and the girls were really pretty, you know? <laughs> so it was like what you want when you're like, you know, 22, 20, 22 years old. Uh, yeah. And at that time I was finding really that I needed that connection and I found the solitude of being a visual artist like almost uh, unbearable. Like it was a time when I was finding that the alone, the alone time in the studio was stressing me out in a very extreme way and was was yeah. giving me visual, a lot of anxiety. Yeah, visual art is kind of a solitary endeavor. And so you're making this new deck that's going to explore the acting side, right? Not the acting, narrative side. Yeah. The, so, yes, so, I, so I went, you know, I was, I went full bore at being an actor. I was a professional actor in San Francisco and in New York city. Yeah. And I ended up getting my master's degree in, in acting. Oh, wow. So, and, and, and so I ended up studying acting at a very, very high level. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I really learned specifically from grad school was a like rock solid process mm-hmm. that included very clear things to do mm-hmm. and very, very clear things to not do. Mm-hmm. Because I think that and your what are process those? as a, um, I, well, I mean, I, I think that it really, I had to really learn how to treat um, the idea of the objective or the mode or the motivation. There's lots of different words for your character's 
objective or their mo- motivation or their um their yeah, why they do what they do yeah i think that there's a long time that for me was like almost like a um academic exercise mm. as opposed to something you really wear under your skin and like you go after like you were gonna murder somebody <laughs> and that's where um that's where acting where you and then you really start to do it to that other actor specifically oh. you're not just like out in the play trying to i'm trying to get my objective like from out here somewhere to really f- get it from that other person and to really try to like really reach inside their soul and turn them to your advantage so and they're doing the same thing to you and that's when i really started to feel like acting was like sports where acting was like actually playing where that's what makes acting alive from scene it's like to a scene. volley huh yeah, it very much is like a sword fight kind of, or like a um, like a kung fu fight. Yeah, and so how does psyche play into uh-huh. this? I mean, I think um, you're a double power: the illustration and then the acting, and now this card deck takes all yeah. that. And I am a I am a double I am a double useless power, or like <laughs> a, because the two don't really like you know art and theater don't really like meld together extremely well. I wouldn't well. say that at all. They've come together in, in this, this one deck. project. Finally, they did for a long time. They really fought at each other. Those right. two, those two things were not cooperating in my life at all. They were very different needs. They were very different crowds. It was yeah. very hard to put together any kind of a show or a project that integrated them. So it was always like one or the other, one or the other. But when it came time to make this narrative deck, I was like, I think that I am uniquely positioned to create this thing. I think so. And it is unique. I think it's fantastically unique. I mean, it does. So Psyche, what are the categories that are going to be in Psyche? There's eight categories in Psyche. Four of them are what I call the core categories. Mm -hmm. Those four categories uh, apply to any character anywhere in drama. So whether it's Jane Austen or Quentin Tarantino or Shakespeare or uh, a Greek tragedy, these will apply to any character. And what are those for? Um, Before we go there, let me just just say the other four categories are very, very genre dependent. And they come in, again, these separate sets that are meant to be swapped in and out with the core set, depending on what genre okay. or what style you're working with. So okay, so are they like, in two different decks? So you got four and four. I'm throwing gang size here. Four you and are four. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the in what I call the core set box, the main, the main box, you will mm-hmm. get the you will get the um it comes with a what I call the companions. It comes with the c- cards for c- contemporary life for like okay. a normal story set in our in our real world. Okay. So you get all the core cards mm-hmm. and then you get the the companion deck for contemporary life cool so you asked me what are the four core categories yeah they are uh first is motivation you motivation know, what, what, what is your character's want? motivation okay mm-hmm. what do they want in this story what do they want in the world right now yeah uh, and then there are strengths and flaws okay strength yeah. and flaws that's two different categories right and a, so you and get a, a strength new, yep, and, and, and you get a flaw and a whole new gang sign from you <laughs> W. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one is called given circumstances. So it's some detail of their experience, which in some cases are value neutral. In some cases are positive. Mm-hmm. They're real pluses for that person. And in some cases they're real like handicaps or real minuses for the, for that person. Right. Right. Do you have your um, prototype deck there? Yeah. Uh-huh. Can we do one? So people yeah, can get an no, idea for sure. We can do one. Let's um, do it. Where are my core cards? All right. All right. So, uh, and again, the, this doesn't exist yet. People it's coming, TV, you guys, people you in TV a land. sneak um, peek. My friends, I've been telling them about it. And like I told you, my friends, um, I ran through the deck with some educator friends, uh, some teachers, and then a writer. And she's like, I want it. I want it nice. so bad. And I'm like, okay. me too. And I'm not even a writer. I yeah. just, is this going to, is this going to air before Christmas or is this coming mm, after Christmas? I think probably after Christmas. I think I've got okay. three episodes before you and we're doing every other week. So, okay. Well, um, this doesn't, you know, this is still in production. So it's, I was going to say it's not available for 
uh, holiday purchase, but it will be available hopefully, you know, in the, by the winter time, by the mid to late winter. Okay. And where can they go to check? Let's, let's get that right out there, right out front. Where do we get, sure. where do we get reckless deck? Cause you can get reckless deck right now, right? You can, yes, you can. Mm-hmm. These are in, these are in stock. You can get these, these are um, available at recklessdeck.com. Okay. And then psyche, is that going to be a Kickstarter? It is. It was a Kickstarter already. Oh, okay. Um, we did really well. We did $238,000 for that. Kickstarter. <gasps> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So that, uh, that really showed me that I was right in that there's a lot more people who want to be writers in the world than who want mm-hmm. to draw fantasy characters. So I think that bigger this market, bigger market. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to just point out that these are the paper play test cards that I created to help me actually play test and, um, you know, and lock in the content. So that's, well, I want to thank you for sharing them with us. This is like a special sneak peek. This is so special guys. We're going to see behind the scenes and hear how we made this. And so cool. Our motivation for our character is to escape financial ruin. Hold it back just a little bit. So it focuses right there. Yeah. Uh, there we go. To escape financial ruin. Mm -hmm. So that's their motivation. Fantastic. And then so they've we been living strength. on the street or they were just totally poor. Or they are, you know, like Willie Loman, you know, somebody who it was a middle, middle class guy who is getting basically is getting old and is getting phased out of his life. You know, he has mm. no way to um, to support it for his family anymore. Mm. God, rough. Um, where are strengths? OK, that strengths. will make people do crazy things. Oh, yeah. And tr- as an entrepreneur, trust me, I know uh, I'm like, I literally could wear this on my forehead. <laughs> I need one too. Maybe we should play that game where we lick the card and stick them on our forehead. <laughs> because, you know, we, maybe we can talk about this later. The <laughs> risk is real. Like when you get involved in like do, putting all your eggs in a basket that is like your IP or your project, the risk is really, really real. Yeah. Financially and emotionally and relationship it is real on so many levels Mm -hmm. all right hit us with our next core attribute what do we got next Um, strength okay our strength right back up just there we go adaptable adaptable. d can adjust quickly to changes in circumstances or information okay that's a good strength so they didn't we say earlier that we needed to be adaptable we needed to pivot yeah yeah as entrepreneurs and artists we need to be adaptable so this person does that well. Oh, that's a big strength. Oh, tricky. Okay. Are you ready okay. for this? Yeah. Flaw. Oh, here comes the flaw. Ooh. Hypersexual. Inappropriately preoccupied with cultivating flirtations and sexual opportunities. <laughs> Have you what ever were we person? talking? <laughs> yes. What were Have we talking know? about before the podcast? <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. We were talking yeah. about <laughs> people that are constantly looking for the hookup. Yeah. And, and, and in circumstances, you know, I feel like one of my for that card, I feel like the go to character that I think of for that is James Bond. Like oh, James, yeah. Bond, James Bond is a character who really brings his personal life to work with him <laughs> and is always like, I know I'm supposed to save the world, but can we just like let's get it on baby yeah i'm shooting people but it's hot come on let's go join me in this crazy escapade as i blow the world up you know i had a friend um that i used to know in new york city who i feel like as i knew him really like started to kind of devolve in a way in regards to like his relationship needs and was putting it out there in a way that i got to the point where i was like wow okay that's getting intense you know where we just it was it was starting to become like a little too out there and a little too like and it would come out really quickly and with people and in places where i was like this is not the time for that right right this is not a hookup this is not you know picking somebody up at the bars we're not 21 anymore yeah so i don't know if you've ever known that person but that that is a um and, and I think it, that's a common trope in movies, though, because it does move things along. I can think of tons of characters that are really flirty. OK, yeah, yeah. You know, it's part of the movies. It's kind of they say sex sells, right? OK. 
Um, so that, oh, and we need a given circumstance. Okay. Yes. Yes. So All we've right. got Which, our power. We got our strength. We've got our motivator or excuse me, not our power. We have our strength, our weakness and our motivator. So he's broke. Oh, I wonder if this character is actually trying to find a sugar daddy or a sugar mama. Okay. You know, inappropriately. I want to give you a couple of examples of this category so yeah. that you can see how it functions in terms of it being um, sometimes value neutral, sometimes a plus, yeah, sometimes yeah. sometimes n- not so much. Okay, so we have, All right. here's one, comes from poor family. All right, okay. that's a good example of, of a- Given circumstance. So we know that they're trying to escape financial ruin and that potentially they come from a poor family. Has a chronic pain of some kind. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah. something hurts and hurt, it's hurt for a long time. I don't know why I go straight to Batman. <laughs> sure, okay. He's, yeah. He's got to be in rough physical condition at this point. Um, committed mentor who helped them excel in their field. Ah, Batman which again. Is... He's got his butler, Alfred. <laughs> <laughs> so which of those do you like for our character? Mm. I like the mentor one because okay. it adds this extra element. So you've got somebody who's trying to get out of financial ruin. Their weaknesses, they're kind of flirty um, or inappropriate, and but they're able to pivot. So that means they might hop from, you know, opportunity to opportunity. And then they've got a mentor who I could see as like comic relief being like, dude, what are you doing? Okay. This All right. Like a comic relief or like somebody who's really dry and sarcastic, like, like Alfred being like, sir. <laughs> Have you ever seen the Lego Batman? Oh, yes. Yeah. So funny. So good. Yes. That's kind of where I go with the Batman thing is I just think of lego batman who is over the top yeah i'm so handsome i've got nine pack abs i've got an extra ab (laughs) you know or whatever i love it that's that's the uh that's the core set those are that's the four that's the first four that apply to any cat get any character in any um genre or any time period all right so hit us with the next four now i picked i think we did this last time too though um i chose sci-fi Okay. As our genre that we are going to create a sci-fi character from. Okay. And what other genres are there? Um, there's sci-fi and cyberpunk is the one that we're working from right now. There's mm-hmm. epic fantasy, you know, which is like a straight mm-hmm. up D and D there is um, steampunk and Victorian. Mm-hmm. And there was Remember. noir too, wasn't there? Lovecraftian and noir. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is really cool. So like very pulp for 1940s, um, that sort of femme fatale Sam Spade type thing, yeah. but with a Lovecraftian horror element to it. Right. Um, then there's horror in urban fantasy, which is much more of like a contemporary horror. Yep. Yep. There is um, dystopian and post-apocalypse. Okay. I love it. So you guys, you get these four core things going on and then you layer these other parts on. So do it. And then the last one is espionage. 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 Oh, yes. Okay. So 007. Yep. Yep. Or um, Jason Bourne or. Um, oh, yeah. Those were good. Jack Ryan, all of those kinds of characters. Got it. But we're going to do sci fi. Okay. Okay. I'm going in for a occupation, right? Which again okay. is very rooted in the style or the circumstances. The occupations that you're going to get in sci fi are really completely different than the ones that you're going to get in epic fantasy. Right. All right. Uh, leaning heavily into the cyberpunk, I think. Um, club dancer or performer. <laughs> well, that goes with our sexually inappropriate or flirtatious. It does. It totally does. And now I'm, I'm trying to decide whether it's a male or a female, whether I've got a Chippendale or a, or a pole dancer. <laughs> So the next, um, and you've got, you've got things that are very, you've got occupations that are very Star Trek, right? you know, things like uh, we could have ended up with a ship's engineer or chief mechanic. Oh, that'd be cool. That could have been, and also um, very, uh, very Star Wars. You know, there's like uh, lots of crime stuff like smugglers and uh, 
you know, well, that'd be forgers cool. and, and that kind of thing in here. Oh, that'd be really neat. Yeah, I like that idea. So, um, you know, if you don't like the card you pull, you can always pull another. Totally, totally. Uh, but I, I have a feeling this is going to come together in a really cool way because you don't necessarily, just because they're a club dancer doesn't mean that's, that could just be like their cover. That could be their yep. front. Yep. The next totally. category is, is, uh, is secrets, right? Okay. So something that your character is holding back on some piece of information mm-hmm. or something that they are keeping to themselves. Right. Which right. you asked me, you know, like, what are the, what are those kind of um, pillars or tent poles of, of utilizing craft to make characters? Um, we, you said like, what, what are those things that you learn to do as opposed right. to not? Secrets in terms of character building is a big thing. Mm. having having a, a personal secret that you are keeping uh, mm-hmm. that your character is keeping is a really fun way to like juice up a situation or to really like crank up uh, a level of stakes yeah and you know there's that empathy factor too i know in a lot of movies there's like a backstory to a character or a secret that they're hiding yes that can really create empathy for the character we'll talk more about backstory in a second mm. this character's secret is that they've obtained a star chart to a hidden smuggler's moon said to store the valuable treasures from a fabled space pirate. <laughs> it's a lot of words. I'm Fantastic. Sure gonna... Back it up. Oh, there we go. Obtained a star chart to a hidden smuggler's moon said to store the valuable treasures from a fabled space pirate. I love it. So now to me, since we're in science fiction, now they're mm. on a ship and they're they're the like the entertainment on a ship for like oh weird like a like an enter like a cruise ship kind of thing like a yeah. space cruise ship yeah and maybe they're entertaining pirates or okay you know I don't know but they've got and, this star chart and they're trying to get there and we're doing the thing already that you know um you know remember I taught I taught that workshop when we were at Aluxcon yeah where um where you start to make connections between the cards and then it starts to automatically like you start to almost reverse engineer into story. Yeah, you right? have so to. Your brain just, it forces, your brain tries to connect the dots. It's kind of like gestalt principle. So you've got, um, we've, we started with a character who needs to escape financial ruin. And suddenly we've got a smuggler's moon, a map to a smuggler's moon full of treasure. Yeah, and it, it makes suddenly, sense. It becomes almost like a little bit of a, a Da Vinci Code race. Now, what's to get- weird is how well these all work together, even though they are so disparate, so different. Every time I've pulled from these, it just works. Your mind just goes there and makes yeah, it work. Yeah. And, and sometimes they really don't work, but that tension creates an opportunity to create connective tissue that yeah. makes those two um, opposing forces. Makes it fascinating. Work Actually, yeah. when it, when they're really disparate, you know, a, a, I think it makes it more fascinating, more interesting. Yeah, that that tension there is like a lot of gold in yeah. the space between as those two things rub up against each other. No doubt. All right, and what's uh? So we talked about backstory, right? The next yeah. the next seventh category is called um, inciting incident. No, I'm um, sorry, formative event. Formative, formative event. event. The thing that happened, and I said that because these. Um, play test cards are printed on the wrong card. There's like a, I have to make a sci-fi, my designer made an error and I have to make a little mental leap whenever I deal with the sci-fi cards. No worries. Uh, so formative event is a circumstance from their past that really formed who they are now. And All that right. could be, that could be, that could have been an ongoing circumstance, like the kind of school they went to right. or the kind of family they were raised in, mm-hmm. or it could have been like a sharp shock, like a trauma or- Like um, Batman. <laughs> like Batman, totally. Loses or his like, parents. Or maybe they won the lottery. You know, maybe they suddenly had a Dickensian reversal of fortune. Yeah. yeah. Where suddenly they went from being poor to being rich. Or something. All right. Like well, let's see what we get. Let's see what we get. Um, Keep me one. This is going to throw you for a loop. Okay. Was sold as a child and raised as a trained assassin for a crime syndicate. <laughs> that doesn't throw me for a loop. It makes complete sense with where they're at was sold as a child and raised as a trained assassin for a crime syndicate. So the dancer thing is a pose, man. It's, it's a, it's a front. They're making money. They're trying to get out of financial ruin, but in reality, they're an assassin. 
<laughs> That's great. I love it. What a story. Yeah, it's coming I mean, together in a cool way, right? Yeah. I mean, the elements are all provided for you. And then the way you put them together is the artistry. But it's fantastic. Here's your last category. Okay. Uh, which is called inciting incidents, which is the which is where really the catalyst. I'm, it's the catalyst, exactly. It's the um it's the thing that um sort of flips over the apple cart of your character's life that sends them on the journey of their story. Yeah. Okay. The hero's um, two journeys hit us. They've learned the fellow cadet or trainee they were in love with and believed was killed during a mission has actually been held prisoner for years. Ooh. <laughs> so we've got money. We've got romance now. Hold still. Back up just a little bit. There. They've learned the fellow cadet or trainee they were in love with and believed was killed during a mission has actually been held prisoner for years. Well, maybe during their assassin training. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally, totally. Oh, wow. wow. And so how does that connect with the Smugglers Moon story? You know, so now somewhere along this, either in opposition to the mission to the Smugglers Moon or connected to the Smugglers Moon thing, we have this lost love that is now found out to be alive. <laughs> oh, I love in it. True, in true Outlander. Yes. Jamie he and must Claire go. fashion. Actually, I went to Black Widow. I think Black Widow, she had a sister, sister assassin. Yes. Remember yep. her yeah, backstory yeah. is her sister gets separated. She thinks she's dead. And then kind of in the middle of the, the story, you find out she's not. And yeah. Cool. So that's all eight categories of how psyche fits together. I love it. Psyche is going to be epic. I I'm so excited for it. I want a deck really do. It's a massive system too. I mean, it's, it's like what it's eight decks altogether. Is that right? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And it's the, uh, the original reckless deck was, I think the whole system was 500 cards, 508 cards. Mm -hmm. Psyche is over 2000 cards. It's a huge system. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. So let's talk about educating your okay. audience. So we, we did art, do. we did product, we did okay. presentation. And now let's talk about educating your audience, because I think we touched on how do you build your audience as an entrepreneur? And this tool you've created really is an educational tool. So we kind of have two angles here with this question. Um, how did you realize what a great educational tool this is and how do you help people understand how to use it? Like how is your messaging for educating it's, it's people? It's really hard. The messaging for this product is really difficult and I still feel like it's a work in progress, though it is mm-hmm. much better than it used to be. Right. Isn't, don't you find promotion and educating your audience about what you've created is always something that's evolving and is challenging, but it's almost like a living thing that you have to massage and you have to put it out there and then you have to massage it and change it. And it just grows and it evolves. And it's, it's that pivoting thing too. It's, you know. Yeah. The, I think that we talked about this a little bit the last time. Yeah. Um, and that's that the big frustration is with this. I have to spend a fair amount of time telling people what it is not first. And I think that we talked about this. And then that night at Showcase, the very first person that came up to me said the first two things that I'm about to tell you is, um, is this Magic the Gathering is the first thing they want to know. You're right. And I have to be like, no, it's not Magic. Like backpedal out of Magic the Gathering and tell them like, you know, how it is not. And they're like, well, how do you win? You know, how's the, what's the gameplay? And I'm like, it's not a game. It's, you don't win. It's, it's an activity. It's a creative activity and a creative tool yeah. to help you elevate your own ideas and to help you get out of that miasma of where to start. Like, it's just sort of like a, you know, like you're in jello is kind yeah. of how it feels yeah. when you're trying to get a story or a character to, to pull together. And it is something that just helps you like we just did with the character. It helps you overcome writer's block. Yes. 
Ashley Clark, I think you said something really powerful just a second ago, and I'm just going to reiterate. I think sometimes starting, if you're trying to come up with messaging for your work, for a product, for whatever, I think starting with what it is not or answering the question of what it's like or what it is not like Mm -hmm. can be a powerful starting point. Mm, So you you've listened to your audience and your audience always asks you, is it Magic the Gathering? Is it a card game? How do I win? And the answer is, no, it's not magic. No, it's not a card game. It's a tool to help you overcome writer's block or creativity block. And so I just think that, I think you said something there that was really, really a great tip. Well, right on. I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's been a challenge, you know, and the other really hard thing is finding your audience because I, like, I learned this a lot from doing shows. It's like a giant lottery ball, a convention and everybody at the convention likes nerdy stuff, say, you know, they might yeah. like Marvel movies or they might like um, magic. They might like D and D they might like star Wars. Yeah. But there is a real range from consumer to creator in across that spectrum. And Mm. this product is for creators. Mm -hmm. There are those people who just want to consume content. They're not going to, they're not interested or motivated to make their own thing. They just want to eat the entertainment that other people put out there. They're just consumers. And that's fine. It but is it's fine, a different, but in it's a different finding market. your, in, but not at a convention or not on the internet there, you're, mm. you're, you're basically putting your message out there and it's no way to find out ahead of time who the creator is and who the consumer is. Mm. So at shows, I can waste a lot of time and burn a lot of minutes pitching to people who are never going to buy it. They want me to see, they want to see the show. Like they want to mm-hmm. watch the monkey dance, but they <laughs> But they don't, they're not going to buy it. Yeah. They want to see, they, they want to see you, you put on your, you know, PT Barnum show and mm-hmm. demo it because it's entertainment. It is. But they're not going to buy it because they're never going to go home and create something of their own. So right. finding the creators and they can be a creator on any level, on any skill level. They can be mm-hmm. beginner to, you know, Mike Mignola. But, yeah. Um, you know, who's the guy who made Hellboy in case you know who, know who that is. Mm. But like um, they could be at anywhere along in their process and this right. will meet them at their level and be challenging to somebody working at a very, like George Lucas could pick this up and, yeah. and it would challenge him. Just and the I same think... as like some high school kid who's never written a book before, or never written a story before, but might really want to will be challenged by this. Sorry, I go on. No, no. This leads perfectly into E. Well, from E, educate. We're talking about how do you educate your audience? How do you communicate what this thing is, your product? To A, for Amplify, how do you find that audience and reach more of them? Okay. So what have you found? Um, how do you find those creators? How do you, how do you, you know, like you said, you go to the conferences. That's a great way. I've heard from a lot of artists and a lot of creatives that conferences are still a really great way to network and they're very effective. And they're some of the most effective way for getting the word out there and amplifying and doing more and networking. Um, but then you just mentioned that there's both consumers at conferences and creators and your markets for creators. So how did you find what do you find works to kind of narrow that niche down and find your people and amplify? Um, I've ever since the LuxCon, you know, I've been really down like in the trenches trying to build and do the design work and the artwork for Psyche. So I have not okay. had a lot of time for marketing, you know, or for social media, but ever since the LuxCon, I really been working hard to get something on Instagram every day. Mm. you know, to really grow that Instagram audience. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, and I have Instagram plugged into Facebook. So like Reckless Deck has done a lot. I've done a lot more posting Mm -hmm. on Facebook and Instagram since the LuxCon that I have in a long, long time. And I'm starting to see that audience grow. Are you posting the development process? No, because really the development process is just like spreadsheets. It's not interesting visual content. 
And okay. it's really, it's really, you know, once the cards are made, they look really cool. But right. right now, all that content is still living in a spreadsheet. And, mm-hmm. and so that's not, you know, that's not super sexy. <laughs> right. Oh, what? You don't think spread sets or spreadsheets are sexy? <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> I, could, I could try it. Um, <laughs> Even if they're color coded. <laughs> but it is, you know, how to, how to educate, how to amplify. This is the hardest piece for me because this is um, like we talked about, I think, Funko Pop, right? Did we talk about Funko Pop last time? I don't recall. Those dolls with the big heads of the characters. Oh yeah, yeah, and they're you know, just actors and actresses and just, movie characters and. In a lot yeah. of ways, I f- I feel like um, Funko Pop dolls are the antithesis of Reckless Dead because Funko Pop dolls don't have a purpose; they just sit there. They're yeah, just, they're like beanie babies. Yeah, they're just like a decorative object or collectible Collect chunk of plastic. Them all. Uh, whereas Reckless Deck has a very specific purpose and is geared towards really motivating and um, uh, maximizing your creativity. Yeah. You know, it's really not a delivery system of a, a finished creative product or world. It's about you getting your creativity off the ground. Yeah. Uh, and a Funko Pop doll also is already based on somebody else's IP. You know, yeah. I know we've used that word a lot and thank you for like taking <laughs> the time to define what that means up front. Because I'm sure people watching this are like, oh, this guy, that, those, that word again. <laughs> it's not really a word. It's an acronym. That's true. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's like you collect the Marvel Funko Pops or you collect the Sabrina the Teenage Witch Funko Pops or the right. Game of Thrones Funko Pops, which are all based on some other story or some other um, property. Right. Whereas Reckless Deck is about making your own property and making, seeing the value in your property that you create as valuable as Spider-Man or Batman or Game of Thrones. So do you have um, hashtags that you use in your posts? Like what kind of, you know, I think if you have a Funko Pop doll, you have a very easy hashtag, you know, you're selling it or whatever. And it's hashtag Dr. Strange, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the character's name, you know, or hashtag Funko Pop. Action or, figure, collectible, toy collectible. Right. That sort of How thing. did you find your hashtags? Like what what kind of hashtags do you use for I'm still, creative? I'm, I'm still finding them. You know, with the Christmas season coming upon us, I'm realizing that, oh, oh like best Christmas gift, uh, creative, oh. creative gift, great gift idea. Yeah. Um, Unique gift idea for you, creatives. Right. Unique gift idea, creative person gift. Those I've found right. that there's like, you know, a lot, a lot of people following those, uh, those hashtags and Very also cool. um, character creation, you know, drawing, mm. drawing, painting, concept art, um, character creation, character concept, character design. Right. Are all so really important ones. You really got to explore those hashtags. Do you use any particular tools to research hashtags or anything? Sometimes I will use, you know, like if you just do a Google search for like hashtags for blah, you, there's a couple of sites that will give you some pretty useful ones. Cool. Cool. All right. Let's talk about licensing and contracts real quick. We're getting to the end of the acronym appeals, art, product, presentation, educate, amplify, licensing and contracts. Mm -hmm. What experience have you had with licensing and contracts and what would you share with us? Some tips and tricks, thoughts, um, I don't have a lot to say on this topic. I mean, I had a con I've, I've had contracts with designers mm-hmm. that have bailed, you know, I've given designers deposits and they've bailed really, which, yeah, which I think is lousy, Bummer. but yeah. am I going to take the time and energy to go sue that person? Like you really have to pick your battles. I feel like, and decide where you're going to put your energy and be yeah. like, okay, well, that deposit was only 500 bucks and the work that they did do was worth the 500 bucks that I paid them. And so I'm going to move on. I think it's really interesting, Clark, because you're kind of, um, because you've created an intellectual property and you've got this big product, you've had to hire designers and artists and creatives. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a different angle than we've had on the show before, because most of the time we're talking about it in terms of licensing your product to a bigger manufacturer. Um, Have you been approached by any manufacturers to license Reckless Deck? 
that's my one question. And then let's talk about like, how do you hire creatives? You said you've actually hired some creatives to help you because it's such a massive endeavor. Yes. Um, and I think that you, when you get to this point, you have a community around you of artists, of people who are, you know, actors, actors who write, writers. Right. And I needed all those things for this. I yeah. did, I would say 80% of the writing for this, I did myself, but I definitely right. valued the contributions of others for sure. Not you just have for somebody their, to bounce it off of something. Yeah, not egg. just for their own good ideas, but also the good ideas that their good ideas gave me. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I felt like their contributions were like doubly wor- um worthwhile. So you have a standard contract that you would just use when hiring people? I do. And some people are really interested. Some people really want that contract and some people don't care so much about the Mm -hmm. contract. Mm -hmm. Um, My goal has always been, and I think that this really comes back to what being a waiter was like. um, I want the people that I hire to have a really good experience. I want to almost feel like a host Mm -hmm. to a certain degree. And I want to pay them, you know, a decent amount of money. Like right. there are definitely places out there that pay artists crap. And yeah. I, and I want, and I really valued their contribution a lot more and mm-hmm. I wanted to pay them better than that. So well, I find I'm, it's fascinating. You're an artist hiring artists. So yeah. are there really any free. flags, like any indicators that you can give somebody that will say they wanted to hire an artist or a designer? Like what are some of the things you look for? Or some of the red flags that you say, Oh, maybe I don't want to work with that person. Well, you can, if they're not timely in their email and returning their emails, you know, mm, if they, okay. I think that you want somebody, the thing is, I mostly know everybody that I've hired on personally, you know, I've met them at shows, I've hung out with them, I've socialized with them, and I've known them for a couple of years, and I'm familiar okay. with their, with their body of work. Yeah. So um, really, like having the opportunity to work with them is a kind of without really knowing I was doing it, I've been vetting them for a couple of years already. Yeah. So you like working with friends. Some people say, don't do business with friends. Well, I think when your friends are in the same business that you're in. Um, and I think that everybody that I know that's an artist is working at a really high professional level and they want to do good work. And yeah. they see this as an opportunity to get their work out there more. They're yeah. going to have a new portfolio piece. They're going to have a new piece that they can post on their social media. Yeah. So um, it's, it's an opportunity for them to further their business as well. Yeah. I think when you've made friends at conferences at this level, like you talk about, then I think it's just fun to do business with friends. It, totally. It's, I think yeah. it's smart. And it's really, um, I remember when I was an actor and I had somebody like I was w- 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 acting in a theater company for Shakespeare for the summer. Um, the artistic director gave a really inspiring speech and he talked about how fun it was, you know, as an actor to then be the artistic director and suddenly have all these jobs to give away. You know, oh, like, Yeah instead of being the one clawing and scraping, being like, Hey, is there a part in this for me? You know, can you, I'm an artist. Can you hire me? You get to actually give away jobs. That's, that is tool. Yeah. 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 That's a good idea. All right. And finally S for success. Um, How do you measure success? I think I added this kind of at the end after I came up with the acronyms, appeals because I was interviewing everybody and I came up with the acronym appeal to kind of categorize a lot of information. Right. Right. And I think it's a pretty brilliant um, acronym with a lot of really good progression. And (laughs) uh, as as a creator, I think you need to look and make sure you check in those boxes. It's a real, it's not just to understand what's already been done, but as I think it's useful for a creator to go down the list and be like, am I doing all these things? Right. Right. Well, I think of it now as steps because you really do have to step through it. You got to make the art, make a product, present it, educate your audience, figure out who your audience is, figure out how to get it out there more, how to license it, understand contracts. But then I added at the very last kind of iteration S for success, because I don't think we as creatives oftentimes stop to evaluate what is success. How do we measure success and how do we celebrate it? Um, there's, you know, there's different versions of success. I do feel like this project um, has given me lots of different avenues for um, what's the word I'm looking for, for positive reinforcement or, or um, affirmation. Yeah, like, Affirmation. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. 
when I see that creator at a convention who really, like, I do feel like there is a core audience to this that really looks at this thing and takes it and like makes it their religion. Like they love this and they really feel, they really um, integrate it into their own creative process really deeply. I love it. When I get those people who are like, their mind just goes like this and you can see that happen. That's, that's very gratifying. And that makes me feel successful. In that Reminds moment, me of being like. a teacher. And when that student gets it, it, it is, it's a beautiful moment. Yeah. Um, I would say I feel successful when uh, this is, was doing really well at getting into retail stores. We're talking about mm-hmm. original Reckless Deck. Psyche doesn't exist in the real yet. I think it hopefully will do very well in bookstores. Oh, it's going to do great. I know it. When it comes out. Um, but when we get Reckless Deck into a, another retail store, um, that feels like really successful. Even if their initial order is small, it's still like a client that is self-perpetuating. It's almost like a, yeah. um, like an income stream at that point, because yeah. they're going to reorder and reorder and reorder. And your stuff is in, um, you know, a, a, like the gift shop in a museum. Yeah. Or Weren't at, you um, in the MoMA? Not the MoMA, but the new museum, the contemporary new, okay. art and yeah. the Bowery, which is also a really prestigious and large um, museum in, you know, art museum in New York city. So cool. You know, when we had a forbidden planet in Union Square, that was like my go-to comic book store the entire time I lived in New York. And to actually have my stuff sold there was really fucking cool, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Post about that. I'm posting you know, that. that. Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon, which is actually uh-huh. the largest, um, not like the largest, uh, that's not a small business, but it's the largest single owned and operated bookstore in the world. Wow. Yeah, Powell's Books, and so they can, they're a great customer of ours. They they burn through these things. Nice. So you know, and when Savannah College of Art and Design took it on, you know, and RISD took it on, you know, I used to take classes at RISD. Now it's sold in the RISD, um, in the RISD store, yeah. and and Savannah College of Art and Design really, really, it's like a really high level art school. They invited yeah. me down there to be part of this like vendor event that they do, and I, I got to demo it like to their students like for hours. It was really Events like those really make me feel like, okay, this is something. This right. is, I'm not just shouting down a toilet bowl or like <laughs> in, into the abyss of the internet right. you know, and getting, getting one like back or something like that. that. Those kinds of things really do feel like, okay, this is, this is a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I but, think you have to value them. And I, and I think that we talked about this the last time. I think it's really important that this gets back in here again um, is the idea that like, this has to work. This has to succeed at this point. I'm too far out over the volcano to you're um, vested. Yeah. And both personally and in the amount of artwork that I have not produced because I was working on this instead. And in terms of the financial commitment that I've made to this, like I'm now like open for business, just like I opened a restaurant or something. Right. Like, I'm I'm invested in this both personally and financially. And it's you can't it, just it, uh, it creates a different motivation i think when you go all in yeah not an enjoyable one either it's not an <laughs> it's not a motivation that i like the feeling of it's it's stressful and it's really like adult adult worlding in yeah a good way adulting but you know what it's part of being an entrepreneur and i think if you have the guts to take it on it's a beautiful thing in the yeah, end. I, I think that you're there is providing a, something amazing. I, you know, I've befriended other entrepreneurs that are further down the road yeah. than I am and their life looks really good. You know, so I, I feel like it's nice to have that, that model mm. of what the future could look like, you know, of what, what it is I'm shooting for, you know, and the level that they've gotten their product to, or their business to, and what, how, what that's done for their career and what their lifestyle ends up looking like both their personal life and their business life. And yeah, they're like, Oh, that looks pretty good. That's worth the risk. I want that. I think that's a really great tip is to have mentors or to have idols or to have aspirations to connect with other entrepreneurs and to see where you can get to mm. as a measure of success can keep you 
moving forward and keep you going in the hard times? You know, the other thing I think that's important, I don't know if this fits in with success or not. You can tell me. Um, eh, who cares? <laughs> it's important. I think it's gratifying to remember that like having a job can really suck, you know, like, ha- and I've had like lots and lots of jobs and a lot of them were like soul sucking misery machines. Yeah. And, you know, as a, as a independent artist and as an entrepreneur like this, I don't work for somebody else, you know, so I don't have to conform to a corporate culture. I don't have to yeah. um, integrate a lot of corporate bullshit jargon into my own, like how I think and speak. Yeah. I don't have to do a bunch of work to elevate somebody else's product or elevate somebody else's business and nobody can fire me, you know? Yeah. Um, There's a lot of positives. Maybe we need a big sign. I think it's a really great advice basically to remember that corporate having a nine to five can really suck. And there's mm-hmm. a reason you're doing this. I mean, the stress is all internal stress from our aspirations and maybe that's worth it to have it being our stress, our internalized aspirations, not somebody else's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So, so that is very freeing. And I definitely, one of the things I'm not, you know, aspiring towards is job. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not looking for someone to hire me. Um, I often think that, wow, work, working for like Pixar would be amazing. But then like, but then you have a job and then, you, you know, and you are working for that company as opposed to doing your own, doing your own work. Yeah. I had a friend who worked on Monsters, Inc. uh, back in grad school. Mm -hmm. And I've got, I've got friends in the 3D animation industry and they work hard. I mean, long hours, like we're talking days without sleep and just endless, endless. So. It's you know, good to remember what's on the other side. There is, you have to really keep that in mind. I met somebody at a convention who had worked for, who worked for Pixar actually. And he was talking to me and he's like, you know, wow, like with your acting background and your master's degree in acting, like if you work for Pixar, you'd be, you know, cause I work as a storyboard artist as well. That's mm-hmm. like my, that's like my illustration day job. Right. And he's like, with all of your story experience and your acting background, like by now you could be like directing movies for Pixar. And I heard that and I kind of wanted to like go put my head in the oven a little Aww. bit. It was like really a tough thing to hear when mm. I knew that I was like instead, you know, halfway across the vast swimming across the vast ocean of entrepreneurship and reckless deck, which in so many ways feels only like barely born, you know, yeah. halfway, halfway out there to hear a guy just casually be like, yeah, you could be like so directing. much further. It's like a backhanded slap. I mean, luckily he wasn't, I think that he was just telling me something good. I think he yeah. was telling me that I had the, you know, the credentials and the capability and the knowledge to do that job. But it was something that I carried away and really felt like a pit in my stomach a little bit for a while. And it took a while to refocus on right. the value of this. And to realize that the grass is not always greener on the other side, because sure okay. you could be directing Pixar, but at what cost to your family? At what cost to your time with your kids and, you know, that type of thing, right? I think it's hard to stay focused as an entrepreneur. So um, that's why we talk about success here at the end. What are the measurements of success? What, how do you personally measure success? I think it's a discussion you have to have with yourself, with your spouse, with your friends, because otherwise you can get sidetracked. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's what I found. Well, Clark, thank you so much for coming on again. I, again, <laughs> I, hey, you know, actually, I liked this one better than the first one. I'm, I'm glad we got the chance to do this again. The first one was was good, but I think it was a nice um, test run to really um, focus in on the thing because I definitely walked away from that being like, oh, I wish I had mentioned this or like, I wish we had talked about that. And right. I feel like we got to do that this time. So, um, so I'm grateful for the chance to get to do it again. Well, thank you. It's like, you know, um, what is it they call when you're practicing for acting rehearsals? We had rehearsal. We had rehearsal. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, thank you so much. Hey, this- is it okay if I mention like what my Instagram, how we're oh, finding please do. Instagram? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, um, t- yeah. My oversight. I always, always ask people at the end, how do we get hold of you? You how can do we find get Reckless Deck, Deck at recklessdeck.com and you can find it at Reckless Deck on Instagram and on Facebook. Uh, and it's also available on Amazon. So you can get on amazon.com as well. Uh, and- oh, geez. Oh, I try to post I connect craft stuff on Amazon. What a rigmarole. <laughs> it totally is. It's a lot of work, right? Oh my God. But there is, you know, you got to do it. So you can so, get Reckless um, Deck from you direct from your website. From, yes. Uh, and your I Instagram both of those. handle. Whether it's, whether it's Amazon or, you know, whether you get it on Amazon or from me, I'm fulfilling those Amazon orders myself. Oh, okay. So, nice. So, uh, might as well just go, go to RecklessDeck.com and get it from me. Yeah. And then your handle on Instagram, is it just one word, Reckless Deck? Reckless deck. Yeah. And my personal, and I could really use some personal Instagram followers more. I'm trying to pay more attention to that too, which okay. is Clark Huggins underscore art. Okay. Clark Huggins underscore art. You got that guys go follow him. Follow me, please. Can I have, a, <laughs> can I have one more gang sign before we sign off? I'm sure. A, sure. Yeah, yeah. The three, the four, <laughs> if you turn it upside down, you know, it's a W or uh-huh. turn it upside down. It's an M <laughs> M for Oh, mask. Um, uh-huh. What was one of the, the attributes in Reckless Deck? We could do one of them was an M, right? Modifications, it was a W yeah. and an uh-huh. M. Uh-huh. Modifications. Weapons, modifications. Weapons, yes. modifications. Well done. Good memory. This was wicked fun. Thank you so much. Let's, yeah. um, let me go and like get really successful at something so we can have an excuse to do this again. Fantastic. Anytime. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Right. Well, guys. Thanks for joining us on the Artist Appeals. Thank you so much. And uh, see ya.